All right. So what is your um, so what is the statement that you are saying? The statement is for if you have a small set X if you have a small X then what is the statement? If we have a small set, then then there exists a, a, a y such that x belongs to that y. Don't we take that just as 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 is? How how then do we should I go about proving that? Don't I just take take that as is? From the it, uh, this is nineteen. You are saying. Yes, for instance, like I, 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 I wouldn't understand how I, I would go about proving that one, for instance. Yes. So, this is obviously the definition. Uh, this is obviously the definition of uh, the of a small set. Uh, I'm just trying to see if we have proved. Uh, uh, so this essentially says that if you give me a small set that exists a y uh, such that x is a member of y and uh, well this is the definition for sure ah so 19 is just after I have come down with all those uh, uh, all those uh, things but I have not till have I not uh, uh, did I say oh that's the next one it week three okay yeah, this is the definition, yes. This is the definition. In fact, in fact, we will go and later on, <coughs> this, is, this is exactly the definition. But then, but then now with regard, with, with regard to, to you giving it as an exercise, should it be just a one line? Yes, yes, exactly. Proof is the definition. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Obviously, uh, because you remember what a proof is. A uh, proof is something like an uprooted, and so it's an inverted tree, where in the basis you have, so these are the axioms. From these axioms, from one of them, or from many of them, you get hold of some more Deduct deductions then comes the next level and obviously when you are defining something so this is obviously a well found formula and you are you you are going to use this predicate as uh, as a formal way to say that well this predicate means this so the proof is just a single line. Small x implies there exists a y such that x belongs to y. So it's a definition. It just stops there. That's it. But if you look into uh, another, another, the next one. Well, let's try this.
so you have to prove this right now so how would the proof go I would like to see finally a proof writing out writing it out should come like this z belongs to this if and only if so here your what is what is the thing if and only if z is small and z is equal to x okay so that is your axiom of extension uh, sorry action of set building okay so this means this is equivalent to saying small z and z equals to x or z equals to x this is just a logical uh, tautology right uh, the fact is that uh, phi is equivalent to phi or phi right so if you write this so you know that from using this you are saying this so that's the reason so this is same thing as saying z belongs to x x again x remove z building and extension right so therefore uh, you have a proof so therefore clear so if you can set up an environment uh, well it is already there if, if you are writing in LaTeX then there is a LaTeX environment in AMS math package called the proof begin proof and end proof whatever you write it will take this and so you can let me see if I can and this one doesn't uh, take take uh, uh, this one doesn't take take let me see if I if it oops it comes as a black box and I'll have to change this no uh, this is not coming here so if you write it so it's begin proof and I don't know what uh, IDE you use for myself whenever I write a begin proof it will automatically write an end proof so no, that is fine in terms of uh, using data uh, I don't use a specific IDE. I, uh, I, I, I use a, a text editor and then type out everything. But uh, you can write something like this proof of equation 20, and you paste this part, and that's it. So no, no, no. No, that, that that is fine with regard to, to, to the LaTeX. The LaTeX part is not the problem. But then, oh, for instance, Doctor, as well, like uh, with some of, for instance, some of the tautologies that maybe we may use, should we uh, just state them, or can we? Do we need maybe to show the proofs of such no. such things? No, we no, can no. Just, we, we can just use. Just them. just use them. Just state them. Yes. Okay. Just take it. And also, also maybe like for instance, the way you 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 you, you wrote that uh, I don't know phi 
implies uh, phi of or, or far or phi as, a, as as just a tautology. We can just state it as that. Yes. As that, right. Yes. Yes. That's the reason. Okay. Uh, let me see. You make a uh, make a rough uh, template, like an array or something, so uh, so that. Each line is followed by a comment, the comment being the reason. And the moment you start writing it in this way, one thing, so that will answer your question, Yanel also. The moment you start writing it, so this is the reason why I am saying that this is equivalent to this. Okay? So whenever you have uh, so, you give me an example, then I, it would be better for me to highlight it. So, whenever I have a problem in, so it could be that the, that one side follows from one reason, the other side follows from another reason. So, that you could, uh, so let's, uh, until, uh, well, immediately I don't have one in my mind. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's, uh, yes, so let's take uh, this, for instance, equation, I say 44. That should be, so equation 44. What it says, it is this, union this, this is equal to intersection. A union B, A belongs to X and B belongs to Y. I think I have written A, B belongs to X plus Y. Okay, so let's see. So how do we start off with this? Z belongs to this. So that is the same thing as saying Z belongs to this or Z belongs to this. Okay? So, the reason is obviously uh, the definition of union or this exactly definition of union how we have, this is the exact reason why we are uh, doing this because it has two reasons we have defined x union y or this for a set a union b that existence is guaranteed by axiom of union and then so they whenever a and b are small sets then there exists a small set such that and so that existence is given by existence of a set which takes in all of them is given by axiom of union and then an use of axiom of extensionality and set building gives us so it's usually these three things uh, the so set building and and extensionality help us to squeeze out those members which we require so that's how we define the union so that's why the reason should be the definition of a union so then it is what does this mean well, this means that whenever I take any x, this means z belongs to t. Uh, this statement is actually logically equivalent to writing for all t in x, z belongs to t. Okay? And similarly, this is, so you could write any one of them. So, for all t in y, z belongs to t. Okay? So, this is obviously the definition of intersection. Now, let's see. There is only one side of the story. For all, now this, so what, if I have to come here, 
I want to say something like this. For all things which belongs to X as well as Y, right? So, uh, to X or Y. So, uh, I want to say something like this. right so it is a it is going to be a statement like this now here is a point if i it is better uh, written if i write it in this uh, form so let me write in this implication form so instead i'll write this statement i always like to write instead of writing for all i usually write it like this so T belongs to X implies Z belongs to T or T belongs to Y implies Z belongs to T. Now let's see how what can I say about this. So I have a statement which looks like this. So if you call this phi, phi implies say uh, well, this is the same thing. So, phi implies so, shy or alpha implies shy. Now, my question is, does this mean phi or alpha implies shy? If these two statements are logically equivalent, then I can write this step, right? Right? Agree? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Now let's see. So when is this true? Evaluation of this statement. So it's a OR statement. So it's better to look into when it is false. So this is false, if and only if. This is false and this is false. Okay? Alright. So let me see. When is this false? This is false when V phi is true. V shy is false. And this is false when V alpha is true. Right? Correct? Yes. yes. So this is true if and only if. So both of them are true. Both of them are true. So this is this is the case when phi and shy, phi and alpha uh, is true and V shy is false. Right? And this tells me that this is equivalent to so this is telling me this implies shy is false. Right? <coughs> Remember, you will say, why not phi or alpha? Well, if phi and alpha have the value true, then this is true. Okay. But, why did I not take phi or alpha? Because this phi or alpha will be true, provided any one of them is true. So, that is the equivalent condition. So it can be that there are cases when V alpha is false and V phi is true, that V phi or alpha is true. So actually this is not the case. The case is phi and alpha implies shy, right? So I can immediately, so this is a side story, okay? So I can immediately write this. And the reason is,
Okay. So that's exactly the reason. And this is the, you don't need to show this one. This is for you. Okay. I'm not, uh, you'll have to you make these. So this is the reason. So this tells me that uh, if you take a T over here, then it belongs to, and then you can proceed, right? So you see, once you have such a, a so this statement required you to prove this for yourself, but you should include that, yeah? Okay. And uh, la lastly, maybe from my side, uh, okay, uh, I, I, I have what I needed. Can I show you? Because the, the, most of my proofs are not... Um, uh, one just, minute, one minute. I could actually, in fact, this is a little bit, in, instead this should be written. Because I don't know whether this T and S should be the same thing. So it should be this. So this implies, this implies this. So this implies this and this, right? So this implies this and this, right? Uh, um, sorry, so this implies this or this. So here, yeah, I messed it up again. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's, one minute, one minute, one minute. So here you would require another, so I want to bring in this statement. T belongs to X and, so I want to see what is this equivalent to, okay? So it looks like this, oops. So it looks like this. So let's let's uh, say it's alpha implies beta, or say gamma implies delta. Okay. So let's put this. So this is this is same as I'm saying alpha or gamma implies beta and delta uh, this way or the other way around I think this should be alpha and gamma implies this so let's see whether this is this is the case if this is the case then we will have to. okay so this one again let's write out gamma implies delta so this is false if and only if v alpha implies beta is false and v gamma implies delta is false this is if and only if v alpha is true v beta is false v gamma is true and v delta is false right so this tells us that v alpha and gamma is true and v beta or delta is false which is the same thing as saying v alpha and gamma implies beta or delta is false right so as we say so therefore this is the underlying uh, the underlying reason so this is equivalent to this uh, oh this is equivalent to t belongs to x and s belongs to y implying z belongs to t or 
z belongs to s and the reason is this okay and then the rest is simple this is your rough work so you put this reason and so this becomes that your t and s is in the x y implies this means z t s so so this is the same thing as saying so you started off by saying this so it means that z belongs to so whenever it is this so z belongs to t union s such that t s is a right so that that's the complete proof of this so you see it right Yes. Okay. And also uh, others, okay. Yanel and others. Uh, your yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So the essential Okay, I'll say the essential dot 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 after what Malatsa had to say. What is it? Okay, uh I think there's only one, one, one exercise whereby I showed uh, the, the implications as, 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 as you did at the top part there. But then with most of uh, the way uh, I write down my proofs, uh, they're more of an explanation kind of uh, thing I can... So... Yes. Do you prefer to show to to show the the, the implications or like if, if 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 I write them down in 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 an informal uh, informal way with uh, wording sprinkled in between the 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 the, the, the whiffs, uh, that is still fine. Okay, so now it's time for me to say what I wanted to say after the session. Well, you are already familiar with all this uh, uh, algebra, this algebra of sets and relations and functions. Am I right? Yes. You have seen all of this. Now, why do I then put them up as exercises? The first answer is that, well, we have learned them from a naive point of view, where every time we were going back to our naive understanding of sets as some collections, and so if it is in here, then but now I have started saying that, well, these are all well-formed formulas and everything can be done from there. So it's uh, what can be done. So that's, that's why. It's, so all of this can be done. So this is the list. And then the second, uh, the second part, the second reason is... And this also obviously works for other uh, areas, uh, wherever, whatever you are pursuing in mathematics. The more you throw out those intermediary words and explanations and take to draw logical reasoning as like this, the more you are sure of the correctness of the proof and the more clear it becomes because these these reasons are your strength they tell you from here to here i have come because of this and if some point you get a mistake 
it becomes or you get at a point where you see hey, this is not right or this is not agreeing with what it should with my then if you it is going back is easier because you will look into the reasons and then you will convince yourself that no this step is right so as i as you saw over here i was looking into this step from here to here so i put in this so if you are uh, you can rework this there are other ways to validate this for you okay was i wrong so draw the truth table or there is a usual algebra of uh, boolean algebra which i can you can use to see no this is fine so if this is fine then there must not be any mistake here so you can actually analyze where the proof at all may have gone wrong and actually say which statement is not equivalent but a follow up so it could be that in some of these steps well i'm just saying some of these steps you could only have this but not the other one so it immediately says this statement implies this statement and it also the moment you write it out in this way it gives you a hint as to how you should find an example to say the other way is not true so you see it is not only about proving but also so this examples actually tell you the boundaries of of the implications right so where it fails so it is, uh, how do you find those examples now uh, it is known it has come to be known that people who are very very uh, meticulous about the proof and the reasons can easily identify these examples because they know that this one doesn't go the other way round this one doesn't work so it doesn't work why so they know that so that's where the reasoning helps you to identify mistakes as well as uh counter examples if it is a single implication or not and so on so you see uh so the second reason is to some extent try and force you to write the proof in this way okay now you will tell me ah this is too much uh, well uh, who was it ben 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 told me he was busy uh, late till last night maybe or may, many of you could have been also similar there are two things this is a year long course so uh you should be able to even if it is not coming every why i say i said every week is so that you do not throw it away i mean to say the the course is uh, uh, if you leave it then it starts fizzling out so to keep you active that's number 1 but okay if you are not getting it within one week you'll submit it next week you submit a part uh, this week and then the next part comes in so you have for each submission you have two uh, opportunities to submit so that's it now that's one one part to say that uh, how you should cope with all of this a second part is if you see that the proof is very similar why don't you make that statement so for instance uh, that's also an observation that you have made so 43 and 44 are very similar right so why don't you make a, a statement uh, or or try and see something else ah is it that if i use 47 and uh, then i can use 43 so 
you don't prove all of them. You prove only the ones which are essentially required. And you give a, and you give a reason why the others follow from this. That's it. So that does that makes you uh, see the fact that you don't have to prove all the 48. You can prove possibly 15 from this list and then the rest follows. You get my argument. Okay, so well, such, such, such a submission uh, also work in the sense that we, we, we provide them as, as for instance, a, a proof of maybe 43 would be, uh, I start off with uh, the assumption and then from 40, then I can infer this, then from 38, I can infer this. And yes. From yes. such, such, and then yes, yes, that yes. result follows. Yes, oh, yes, okay. you can do that. Or you can say that you need to only prove this much. The rest follows from here. All right. Yeah? So why am I saying? Because the moment you do that, you immediately... That's a credit. You have actually seen that this is a consequence of this. So if it is a consequence, why do I prove it twice? If already A implies B, then it's enough for me to prove A. Why do I prove B and rewrite the proof of A again? Why? Because I've given you the reason why A implies B. So you see, so that's again the principle. And that's the principle of a proof. When you look into a proof, right? So if there is already a proof which you know, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, restate that again. You just say it's a, it follows from it, right? So uh, a rough, uh, a rough, what do I say? A corollary to this is: don't immediately open up your uh, file to write the answers. Look into the exercises and try and see if you can reduce the number of things to be written in terms of the others, so in this sense. Yeah, if there are 48 equations, uh, maybe that only 15 are important. Uh, only 15 are, uh, but you have to find that. Maybe only 15 are important. And the rest follows from all those 15. And the reasons are very simple. So you can immediately say, well, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 20, so like these 15s are. It is enough to prove this because 7 follows from this and this. 8 follows from this and this. Okay? So you know. Yeah? And then you provide the proof of those 15. So, you immediately, so this observation actually has, uh, is a good thing that, uh, you understand what I am saying. You have looked into the problem much more than someone who has proved all the 48. You see, what is it? Yeah? Okay. If, if, if you say it in that way, then uh, it, it, it May, it, it, it's much better to do it like that because now with, like with, with me personally I, 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 I thought that yes uh, or I can see some, some follow from others but then I thought maybe the exercise here was for us to maybe uh, also no. get, get, get better uh, acquaintance with the manipulation of, of, of our riffs no, no, given no. given given no. Given the abbreviations that we have and, and, and such. No, no. We are going to learn how to prove things formally. And the one basic essence of a proof is, I am not going to repeat proofs. If one proof is done, then that is done. Yes. So I'll just use it next. After that, I'm going to use it right and left. Yeah? If I require, if someone asks me 
What is the proof of that? I will go back then and show. Yeah, here is the proof of that. Okay? So, if you can recognize that these are the more fundamental ones, so that is a obviously a much more welcome step. And I, yes, I wanted this uh, to come up. I wanted this that it should come up from you. Uh, that uh, you are finding it very, very overwhelming. But then the answer is this. You find the minimum that has to be done. You will very soon see, you will very soon learn this uh, technique. Mathematics, okay, it consists of co both computation and conceptual and so on. But what I believe is, the real computational brute force computation has to be done, has to be effected when no more simplification is possible. So, this is actually a simplifying step to say that, no, no, this statement implies this. So, you have simplified your problem. Okay, so you prove the more elementary ones. And I mean to say the more fundamental ones. That needs to be proved and the rest follows. Okay? So, again it's in line with that same idea that you only use the full power of your proof for things which are very, very essential. The rest should be taken care of. Yeah? Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, thank you. Yes, doctor. Mm. Okay, the next. Next. That's clear, doctor. Yeah, the next. Next question. Next. Uh, uh, question from your side, or else we. Did you, uh, so you looked into, could you have a look into week 3's material and week 4's material? Do you have some queries on them? Sorry, Dr. Uh, I, I missed what you just said. Queries with regards to what? Well, possibly you are not uh, seeing why it is said in this way or what does it actually mean in week 3 or week 4. Um, so, I am not sure if it is a the real question. Um, but in week 4, they specify the different types of relations. And then at number H, they specify um, what the linear order is. And then in the notation, they use a 1 and then the subscript A, comma A. So I wasn't sure what that means. Uh, um, where? Which one? Week 4. And then where they define the types of relations. So it's on the first page. So number H. Ah, uh, yes. You're right. It's not a comma. I. It's a printing mistake. Uh, it's a type type error, typographic error. It would be one a. One a. I still don't know what it means. <laughs> one a. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, one a. If you again again one. Uh, sorry, let me also go back and let me look. I think, okay, come to uh, page, let's see where I uh, looked into the whole relation, how did I need to know? Uh, yeah, I see it, uh, I see it in um, week three, so it might relation, okay, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's one a comma a. Yes, it is one a yeah. comma a. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. And one a is only for the identity, but that one is something else. That's a bold one. Yeah. 
that's one a a is the full relation yes Any, any, any more? There are several links also given in the, during this. It would be nice if you go through those links. Uh, see, why I am saying so? It is also important for the for the course. Why? These links uh, generally would point you to other material. You have obviously your textbook. Now, remember. This is not a first year or a second year course where you are going to have a clandestine exam and uh, you are uh, going to be asked certain how and why questions and so past papers, uh, problems, solutions and you are done. This is a little more different. Why? Because here you will have to write an essay. Your final thing would be writing an essay. Obviously, yes. How will you write the stylistic things and so on and so forth. That will we will come to it slowly. But the more you read this material, what is going to affect is you are going to form your own opinion about these things. So when you are writing your essay, your originality comes from your own thinking. So that is what needs to be reflected and highlighted. Okay? It could be completely different from what is printed, or then it will be a publishable material. Okay? And so anything anything which is logical and acceptable works in mathematics okay so you have to develop your own way of thinking about these things and then expressing it now when you read these extra material you will have a flavor of how to express it and obviously uh, the one which we will be interested in is how the stylistic presentation in standard in journals and uh, usual journals or whatever they have a standard style uh, more or less everyone uh, adheres to it except possibly the web blogs and those although you will be seeing those web blogs also now, the idea is that you have to present your thought, your explanation, uh, in a very simple way, okay? So possibly you will be writing, why possibly, you will be writing an essay, you will be asked to write an essay to explain certain aspects, certain things, in a way that a first year or a second year student can he, he, uh, will understand okay so there you have to express yourself uh, you have to you have to write your own thing so therefore reading through this extra material or having an acquaintance with what is what is thought usually and how is it uh, executed would be very very uh, influential in in your uh, in your essay yeah? so you should read them and they will open up a several whole uh, arena of thoughts this is it is not about just uh, certain computations you see uh, last time also 
uh, I think Eric asked that why am I not sticking to ZF? Well, uh, my yeah, because the textbook is about that. Well, set theory can be done in several ways and all of which are equivalent to a great extent. So it very much depends on the person who is presenting it. You will, I think next week you will, you will actually uh, see a blog uh, where I will be asking you to read through a set theory which is completely different uh, from what we are uh, doing over here. It is called non-well-founded sets or Excelian sets. Excel after Peter Excel. And when it first came up in the late 1800, uh, well, people thought it was just an academic exercise. But uh, today it is being used uh, in several places, for instance, in understanding process uh, algebra. Uh, process algebra means uh, uh, how a computer processes uh, um, the, the algebra used to study or model the processing of a program, not a programming language. A program is actually a well-formed formula, right? But how does those final, that well-formed formula is finally being computed in the machine? So it has much to do with the machine and the constraints of the machine. So it, and there comes up an algebra called the process algebra. So there, they use these exalian sets, which is very much different from ours. But it just differs on a particular action. Okay. So the it, it, as I said, you pick up certain well-formed formulas and start to develop a theory. If you pick something else, you'll have another theory. If you they, if there is an overlap, so there will be certain things which follow from both. And certain which doesn't follow from here, but follows, uh, and so on. Okay, so uh, some theories uh, get a big applaud because well, it explains a lot. Some others don't, but it doesn't mean that that theory is just nonsense. Uh, it just tells something else. It tells. Uh, unlike science, uh, where uh, theories are tested via their uh, correlation with uh, evidences, here there is no evidence to test it along with. Here it is just logical deduction. So you see, it is. Uh, you have much more freedom over here. Yeah. So there can, there are much more possibilities. But again. Okay. So therefore, please also do make some time for those extra uh, readings that are given over there. Uh, yeah. And then I sent, okay, so then let me quickly tell you about uh, week four and the implication of these. So if you have the material there, if you open it, uh, then you will see 4.1 gives the definition, 4.1.1 gives a list of all possible uh, known types of relations. Um, and uh, the first one is, see, the, the usual description of a reflexive relation is given by axiom 79, which says that for every x in A, x is related with x. Okay. Now, 
See, I have defined it via a completely different route I have used and why did I use it? Well, you will see in this course that I am continuously stressing or trying to give more credence to arguments to you have already seen that I am giving more credence to logical manipulations, right? So that's that should get very clear that we are all working with manipulations of well-found formulas. The next part is, even then when I am doing it, why the hell did I took, take 4.1.1a as the definition of reflexive relation and not equation 79, which everybody does? Well, my first argument is that if I have built up this uh, whole bunch of algebra of relations and very various specific relations like the diagonal relation delta A, like the whole relation, like the null relation and blah, blah, blah. Why should I not? define things in terms of them and why should I bring in an another extra layer of saying things in terms of elements? So that's my argument. And people would obviously say well 79 is immediately simple it says uh, we are doing set theory so uh, it immediately says uh, uh, what we have to check. Uh, we have to check, uh, we have to take any x from the set A and say whether x is related to x by that relation. That's it. Now comes my second argument. My second argument is yes, equation 79 holds precisely when we are working with sets. But if I can bring up with uh, an idea of a delta A and an idea of a relation somewhere else, then I can possibly use 4.1.1A to define a reflexive relation. And that is exactly my going to be my point again and again and again. So I will, you will see this credence and to kind of to kind of avoid saying things in terms of elements. Okay? I will always try to say things in terms of uh, uh, functions or relations much more and if at all not very possible then I will fall back on this element wise. Okay. So, that gives the credence to the first exercise which gives an element wise alternative description and then uh, uh, I have asked you to provide the element wise descriptions for the all others. Well, this is quite acceptable, uh, available everywhere but you, you can work it out. Okay? The, the defi definitions are available everywhere but remember when you provide this you have to give the proof. So, you have to prove that that element wise description uh, defines if and only if this condition given is so. Okay. All right. Uh, 4.1.2 is about examples. You might say there are how many? 864 examples. <coughs> you can again, it's, uh, it's, uh, so, rough idea is find as many examples as possible, fill up that table as much, uh, uh, so you can fill, it, fill up by saying that, uh, say, D and F doesn't hold together, uh, so there is no example of such. Uh, or if you say that, well, if something is an equivalence relation, then it is, uh, so something the column E, if you have an example in column E, A or row E, then it should also appear 
in the columns or rows of B, C, D, and so on. Okay, so so you can provide all such relations. So it is actually uh, more about thinking about these uh, relations, uh, if whether they have any uh, e properties which connect them uh, or which disassociate them, and then okay. So again, you don't have to. The idea is you don't have to find all the sixty-four examples find as much as you can and the rest you try to settle via some propositions or some connections okay so it's an open end okay. now the next one is about the whole relation and that is uh, so that is essentially about a cross b and so on okay and uh, the composite of whole relations then reflects if 4.1.4, so that's something that we are going to start. Uh, we will see this coming, things like this, so 4.1.4, 5, well, 6 is not like that, but 7, uh, no, not 7, 4.4, 5, I didn't give uh, the transitive closure. Uh, because it requires natural numbers, so I'll give that once I come to natural numbers. Okay, so you'll see all the transitive closure and hence the smallest equivalence relation. So the idea is that I want what is the reflexive closure? That means it is a reflexive relation on A. So you start off, you're given a relation, it may not be reflexive. So what does it mean that the relation is not reflexive? You have to ask yourself this question. When you ask this question, so whenever you get hold of such definitions as here, the first thing is you must find out conditions. When shall a relation be not reflexive? When it shall not be symmetric, transitive, and so on and so forth. When? So what do you need? And so you see, the moment you see this, you you are immediately filling up this table. Okay, all right. So the question is: suppose it is not reflexive, does there exist a reflexive relation which is bigger or smaller than it? Now, how to uh, how to think of this? So. One way is usually if you have to try and find something which is bigger, you find, see the idea is given by these axioms. Axiom of union, it doesn't give you actually the union set. It gives a small set which is bigger than that. Then you pick from there the smallest one, right? And that becomes your view. So the idea is similar. You find, somehow you find a relation which is bigger than that and reflects it. Now, how on earth on a set you can find a relation which is bigger than a given relation? Well, obviously, there is one, the whole relation. Why don't, you, why don't we take it? And the whole relation is obviously reflexive. Okay? So, the next question, so there is a relation which is bigger than uh, any given relation and yet reflexive. So, now suppose, so I am going to make it smaller right i'm going to make it smaller but lower i'm not going to make it so small that it becomes smaller than r so i have to so the lower bound is known r ceiling is known the whole so i'm going to throw out some elements now which elements can i throw out if you start yourself asking this question then you will see those conditions which told you when is a relation not reflexive will tell you which one of the things you can throw out safely from the whole relation to maintain it containing R and yet being reflexive. And that's exactly this uh, uh, reflected in this. Okay? And once you have this, you'll have the proof immediately. Okay? A second approach would be to say, well, suppose I consider the set 
of all reflexive relations which are bigger than this, bigger than R. So then, then you will say that, okay, let me take the intersection because I know the intersection is going to be the smallest. So the question is, is the intersection of reflexive relations or in reflexive relation? So that's, that's what you are going to prove first, that an intersection of reflexive relations is reflexive. And then you have the answer that yes, the intersection of that. And then what is that intersection? So that gives me this. So if you ask the same question for symmetry in the same way, now what about this anti-symmetric how? If you look into the definition, if you look into the definition of reflexive and symmetry, you will get some kind of an answer. Uh, reflexive is saying that it has to contain something. Symmetry is also saying that the relation has to contain something. Same with transitivity. Antisymmetry is something different. It is saying it has to be contained inside something. So, it is somewhat the other way down. So, so obviously, uh, now, if you have, you have to look into this definition, you see, it says it has to be contained inside something. So, that's the, that's the key point in antisymmetry. Now, that immediately tells you that uh, the whole relation is not antisymmetric. Because the opposite of the whole is the whole again. There is no question about it. Intersection is the whole again. So that is not contained inside the diagonal. If the set has at least two elements, it cannot be contained inside the diagonal. So the whole relation cannot be antisymmetric. Okay. So then uh, you have to forget about trying to find. Now let's see. Uh, is it, uh, it, can the empty relation, so now you are trying to find out the smaller things. Is the empty relation uh, uh, anti-symmetric? Try to find this out. If the empty relation is anti-symmetric. Okay. And then you should think then, okay, then I have to add a few things. And how much, how long can I go on adding, maintaining this condition? And that will then tell us to, to lead to lead to 4.1.6, and that's why it is called not the closure but the hull. You know what is the hull? Have you seen a boat? Obviously, you have. Do you know what's the hull of a boat? It's the bottom side, right? Yeah, the interior. Right? Okay. The interior which, which supports the skeleton, that's the hull. And the kernel is the outside, right? Okay? So, that's why you see why it's called the antisymmetric hull. Because it is the largest antisymmetric relation contained inside R. So, that's why it is called the antisymmetric hull of that relation. Okay? And then. Uh, comes in this inverse and image, image and inverse relations. Uh, image relations means if something is related on the domain, you force it to be related on the codomain. That's inverse means if something was and you pull it back. So look all those pre-images which were related. So that's uh, that's how. And strangely, it satisfies very. <coughs> very nice conditions. Over here from 82 to 86 again, you should see that uh, some one of them is, uh, is uh, uh, well, very, very fundamental. The rest follows. Okay? So, if you can find that out, then you have done. You don't have to prove all the uh, equations from 82 to 86. There are a few which is enough. 
okay and then the okay 4.1.8 is a challenging problem uh, the challenge might be only I believe in the but if you have if you got the idea from 82 to 86 and that is if you have found out the fundamental ones over here your obvious question will be what happens when this is also when this f is also uh, squiggled yeah and that's exactly uh, what we are going to do over here okay that's exactly what we are going to do so it's the diagram is the same except in 4.1.7 f is a straight arrow here p is a squiggle tab okay so that means f was a function a very specific special kind of a relation so you are just pulling it up the same kind of things you are pulling it up when f is an arbitrary relation and strangely many things hold okay strangely many things hold so that's the whole idea <coughs> well uh, next is about functions uh, already we have seen several kinds of functions in the first uh, section so that's what 4.2.1 is about 4.2.2 is again an e similar to axiom of extensionality so it's the extensionality principle for functions okay so you just look so essentially what it is saying that two functions are equal see function comes in with three data one what is its domain two what is its codomain and three what is the rule so x going to fx is the rule so two functions must be same if and only if all these three things are same and that's exactly now uh, i know in books on analysis or well not in good books but in most uh, other books you know you'll ask me what is a good book and what is a bad book uh, by the way what books did you uh, did you use in real analysis uh, did you all have a course in real analysis Yes. Um, so we use Porter and Sherbert's Introduction to Real Analysis. Which one? Porter and Sherbert Introduction to Real Sherbert. Analysis. Sherbert. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then others. I've used uh, Bartle's Introduction to Analysis. Uh, Bartle. Elements of Real Analysis. Robert Bartle. Yes, Bartle. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I've yeah. also used. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Others. Um, I mostly did the Rudin book. Good. And then? Yeah. Others? And then? Uh, Eric? I, it's many aspects since I did it. I can't even remember the textbooks I was using. Uh, and uh, Xander? Same. I can't find my real analysis book now okay many books in real analysis uh, just don't give right just don't consider what Bartley uh, Sherbert and Rudin obviously does uh, uh, they are very meticulous uh, they don't look into the codomain and it is a problem but you see codomain is also important not the range for a function so why am I saying the rule x going to sin x can be injective, can be surjective, can be neither, uh, can be both and neither. Agreed? Okay. Suppose you take the domain to be the whole of the real line. Okay and the codomain to be the whole of the real life when it is neither subjective nor injective okay 
the graph tells you all. Look, look via the graph, you will get it. Okay. Now, suppose your suppose your uh, domain is minus uh, domain is minus pi uh, sorry minus pi by two to pi by two, and your codomain is minus one to one. Okay, then it is both. It is a bijective function. You increase your codomain a little bit; it is no more surjective. And you increase your domain a little bit, so it is minus pi by two to pi. You immediately see you have broken the injectivity. So you see that, and if you play or play with it a little bit, you will see that you can make it injective but not surjective, surjective but not injective, and blah blah blah, all of this. Okay. So you see. The properties of the function properties are just different statements, right? So the properties of the functions differ the moment you change the domain or the codomain. So therefore, you cannot expect a function, the same function to have different properties, right? So as once it is injective and the other time it is not injective, that cannot be true. So the functions must be different. So therefore, uh, in set theory and in plausible everywhere, equality of functions need three things, and that's exactly for point to point. Okay. Now you will see this terminal set, and it is going to come again and again, and then I have produced this uh, usual statements of inject ah that m by ejective that needs to be checked so there are lots of mistakes in this i i i'll send a uh, send the revised version tonight uh, so that is uh, then comes the three characterizations of uh, injectivity and surjectivity and bijectivity uh, you go through it, for instance, uh, you see in 4.2.4, uh, there is something about cancellations from equations or something like invertibility and so on and so forth. And, uh, so these are uh, some very important uh, properties uh, which we are going to use, you will see again and again. Okay. And then the final one is the uh, is saying how we can 4.2.7 it says two very important things the first one is I'm giving an alternate view of elements okay now there's a little bit of a remember we started off by considering the membership relation so it belongs to was our unknown predicate. And then we drew up certain axioms which has helped us to define uh, what are relations and functions and then so on. But we could alternatively started off with just the notion of a function, trying to axiomatize what do we mean by a function, just, no sets, nothing. He'll ask, how the hell are you going to bring it up? I'll say, I'll also bring that up as a specific function. Everything I'm going to bring up as a specific function. So I'm going to draw up certain axioms, okay? Uh, again, that's another game. Play. Another uh, is a, another some something else is uh, my unknown starting point. Using that, I am defining the rest. And the fact that it can be done. That's the 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 clue. And the connection is four point two point seven. So that says functions are. Uh, equally important or equally fundamental as elements. I can define element root by just some functions. 
that's one take on this story. The other take on this story is uh, much more, uh, well, I'm not saying this is uh, not serious, but the second one is a much more serious one, even how we have started it. You will see the next uh, page, remark 4.2.7, a big uh, uh, explanation. And this is, I want you to read it. And it is about, uh, it is about something called naturality. So, I leave it to you to ask yourself this question that you know that a property means a well-formed formula. Okay. Now, what would you consider as a natural opposed to what would you consider as specific? or not natural. Obviously, right? The opposite of the word natural uh, being used in the sense that, well, uh, well, natural and opposite is in the sense that it is not specific. So, uh, what is specific and what is natural? Ask yourself this question. What should be considered as natural and what cannot be considered as a natural so it is much more specific you can you can you can uh, you can obviously uh, think uh, outside sets yes sets or mathematics take events take uh, and try to classify should this be considered a specific or should it be considered natural even events even for events which are happening around us which happen around us what should you consider as natural and this question is going to hit us. The answer to this question, uh, I next day when you read this and when you have gone through this, then we will come back to this question and we will ask. And the way that we are going to look at it is going to influence a lot of mathematics and hence conceptualization after this. We would see things which we would welcome things which are natural and we would identify things which are specific that's that's the more uh, i would not say politically correct but the more in fact more correct approach is to identify things which are specific and find things which are natural okay so that's where we end in 4.2.7 uh, so that's uh, the thing I'll, I'll send a, a corrected version of this uh, by tonight so that's what we have in this section uh, and yeah, now I'll stop and I'll give you the floor. You ask questions, comments, and so on. Yeah?
I have no questions. Zander? Uh, no questions. Thank Yane? you, Doctor. Yanel? No questions at the moment. Thank you. Malatsi? Okay, with regards to the way we, we uh, will be talking about uh, our relations and uh, the way in which we will handle them, they are not necessarily just be confined to small sets. So, usually in most uh, set theory textbooks is that you'll have uh, regulations in the sense that uh, they, these are specific sets, but then you'll also have the case or side notes while going through the, the material where I'll talk about relations in inverted commas whereby you define these things on, for instance, the whole of, uh, or where they define such a relation, quotation marks, on the whole of V, onto V. Correct. Very so much. Now, but if you see... Yes. Uh, the way we will talk about them will be more, le more or less the, 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 the letter one in the sense that... Uh, we are able to also n not speak about them in in, in 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 inverted commas in a sense. Yes. It's much more general. Like yes. You see, I while defining relations, uh, where did I do it? I did it in uh, three point one point five. Okay. Now, I didn't say whether the sets A and B are small. I was silent about it. And if you see all that squiggle arrow notation everywhere, I was silent. Composition, okay. silent. Op, silent. Okay? If you see the whole bunch of things which I have said about the relations and functions I'm silent. So what does it mean? It means that these statements hold good even if the sets concerned are large. They are not small. Okay? And then when I'm coming to uh, section 4, the types of relations that I have said, it also, I am silent. And indeed, what you said is right. In ZF, they put it inside inverted commas because they don't have a handle on large sets. Okay? So, what would they do? But, but it looks very much like that. But in NBG, as I said on the first day, just by giving names, I have produced a handle. So, I can speak about, for instance, belongs to. Belongs to, once I have, uh, I have given the notion of relation and I have given the axiom of set building and extensionality, I have immediately my universe of sets, which is V, which is X, as that X equals to X. So, that is exactly the universe of all small sets, not all sets. Why? There is no set which contains a large set. That is the problem. Well, this is the mortal grossness, uh, but, uh, okay, okay, so... I have the universe of all small sets and that is not a small set at all. So that is a large set. And epsilon uh, belongs to is a relation on, is a subset of V cross V. What is it? It is a collection of those pairs A, B says that A belongs to B. So it is a relation. It is a valid relation. And everything everything that I am saying over here 
works for for belongs to also. So the question is is belongs to transitive. We will see that there are certain sets where belongs to is transitive. Is belongs to reflexive. Well, what is the problem with belonging belongs to being reflexive? Means x is belonging to x. Well, if we start with this kind of a thing, x belongs to x, then again it so we have already have seen an infinite chain going down. So our uh, so x is equal to the singleton x. Why? Because x belongs to x and you see if you argue it out it will see by set by uh, set building and ex extensionality if epsilon was reflexive you will have this and such thing is not allowed. We will have an axiom later on to ensure that x does never belong to x. So we will somehow throw it out and we will call it, call these sets to be well founded. And uh, sets which are not well founded, they are precisely the axelian sets uh, and which have application as I was saying and there will be, you will find it coming up. So you see epsilon is, uh, belongs to is not, uh, not well uh, reflexive. Is it symmetric? Well, we will see that it is also uh, not symmetric. Okay, it is on some cases, on some specific types of sets, it will become transitive, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, in some cases, it will in fact become a partial order. In fact, a linear order. In such cases, we will see that. So, uh, yes, in this approach, we will not have those inverted comma relations, right? We will not have relations between inverted commas. We have only one. We have a relation and we have different kinds of relations. Okay? Okay, doctor. Is this that you wanted to ask? No, uh, it, 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 it was more of a uh, 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 side note or something just to note. And then also, is it is it also to some extent a, a, an advantage of 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 NBG, for instance, over ZF? Yes, because as I said earlier, the moment we have a handle to hold, it makes life much more easier. So the moment we can catch hold of these large sets by names, we can manipulate with these names just uh, as we are doing with other things. So when we treat them in the same footing, but remembering one thing that we are not going to put a large set inside another set, that cannot be done. Only this exception, but the rest, if we can do on the same footing, then it provides us a big hand, big advantage. Okay, so we are dealing with large sets and small sets alike, with the only exception that the singleton set for a small set exists, but the singleton of a large set is the empty set. It does, yeah. So that doesn't exist. So with that exception. With that exception, each one of the statements are going to be true in the same way as it is going to be true for small sets. So we will freely then use large sets and small sets, but um, alike on the same footing. So we need not to be always very, very meticulous and careful, but whenever it comes to putting a set inside another set as an element of another set, 
That's when we are going to ask, hey, wait, is this a large set? That's when we are going to stop. If not, we are going to do it. Yeah, agree? Uh, understood? Understood. Yeah. So, any further questions or anything else? Just thought of another one. When you you were discussing functions there, and uh, you mentioned how uh, in some text that uh, they usually never talk about the code domain as such. I was also thinking because now with mo okay when 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 one starts to learn about functions, and usually the idea that they push through is that you can think of a function as a black box in the sense that you pass it in something and then you get something out from like you give it some input and then you get something out now um, and from what you were saying there it's understandable that you can change the uh, properties of, of the function by changing the domain and codomain but mm -hmm. then uh, would also would it be also um, a misunderstanding of what functions are if we say that the okay um, if the you say of, if, if I say that the properties depend on only the domain and then uh, the code domain is uh, does not play such a crucial role. Because now it's more or less like a, like I'm saying in that when when one is taught about functions in the beginning, they t usually tell you that you give it some input and then you get some output. Uh, output. Yes. Hence, I'm saying that uh, the domain would be what determines the properties of the function, or that would be a misunderstanding on my part. No, you're right. The moment you say you take this picture that. You give an input and it gives a unique output, right? So then you are falling back on the idea that there is a domain and the codomain, there is nothing, the codomain is exactly the range, the set of all outputs that you get, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. So you are, from the present perspective that we have taken, in that perspective, all your functions are surjective. Yes, yes. If that is so, then if all your functions are surjective, then you will not be able to do any kind of uh, counting. So you will see once we in introduce the notion of natural numbers, they will help us to count things and um, there will be the standard grades as if along which we are going so it will be a standard uh, natural numbers will become a standard grade along which we say it has one element two element and so on and so forth like that and in that in in, in the in, in in the process of counting there is a fun uh, to enable counting, you need a very, very crucial fact that there doesn't exist any surjective function from a set to its power set. There cannot exist any surjective function. So, in a sense, it is trying to say that the power set is going to be much, much bigger than your any set, okay? Now, when all your functions are surjective, 
then this statement will be there doesn't exist any function from A to its power set. Okay, because any function is subjective in your in your domain, in your interpretation, and you cannot have any such. So there doesn't exist any function. And in such a case, uh, you can do many things, but well, you will not be able to count. Oh, oh, but then, rather, if if you, if you put it like that, w would I be able to not count? For instance, okay, when 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 you take power set, we we usually go uh, a level higher. Yes. Okay, that's with regard to, to uh, cardinality now. But then now, will I not be able to go, for instance, maybe higher than the natural numbers? Maybe I would be able to only lie in in in, in, with, in, in like just the natural numbers, but then I would not be able to go higher than that? Even with natural numbers, you are going to have a problem. Okay. Even with natural numbers, you are going to have a problem because you will not be able to compare between, say, 1 and 2 because there will be no function from 1 to 2. From a 1 element set to a 2 element set, there will be no function. So. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, any, any, any aspect of counting will just fall apart, it will not come in. So, okay, if you want to develop a uh, 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 mathematics or if you want to develop things uh, where you don't need counting or you, uh, you don't bother about it, uh, then maybe you can take this approach, uh, but uh, this is uh, definitely not an approach where you can include counting. You can you can still uh, when we we will see later on we we can still speak about uh, we can still speak about gluing. Uh, things, but uh, you will not be able to compare things. Uh, you will not be able to uh, say uh, whether something is smaller. That you are out. You will not be able to do that. So many things will start failing. Right? But uh, you can still do a few other things, but some things you will not be able to achieve. The same is the other side. If you say that, well, I will only consider uh, functions uh, which not only uh, produces uh, unique outputs, but two inputs will not give me the same output. So that means you are taking injective functions only. In that case, again, uh, you will not be able to compare. So. Uh, you need both injective and surjective functions to speak smoothly about counting, gluing, and so on and so forth. The others will be uh, very partial, and uh, it will not give uh, the our present uh, goal of speaking about numbers and the usual mathematics. And the arithmetic and so on, it will not come in these uh, cases. So, uh, when I said that some books uh, do use uh, these definitions, they are very much uh, flawed. And they are very much flawed. Yeah. One should say, as a proper uh, black box argument, is well, the argument should be modified is saying that well given an input it gives a unique output from a list of outputs 
at least has to be. So now you're now you're putting in a predefined list of outputs. So you have a set of inputs and a list of possible outputs. And what is a function? It's like a black box. So it produces for each input a unique output from a list of outputs. So that from a list of outputs needs to be appended to produce our perception of a function. Clear? Okay. Yeah. So that is missing. Just not, uh, just not saying it produces a unique output, but output from a given list of outputs. So, in other words, you have to take the domain and the codon into consideration. Yeah. yeah, because I have seen books which define functions in this way and then go on to uh, say that uh, uh, the sin x function is sometimes injective. Uh, but how are they doing it? Because if they are saying it's a sin x function, then that it must be subjective already. So it's a it's a flaw. In it's a conceptual flaw in the book. So yeah. But obviously the books that you have read, they are properly written. Uh, Bartley, Sherbert, Rudin, Apostol, uh, they are obviously the very good ones the, and the standard ones. There is a, another book, but that one, well, it does a lot, not only analysis. Mm, I'll try and see if I can set the link to that book. But again, the link uh, which I will send uh, has all those extra uh, baggages. Okay? So, um, it is downloadable. Uh, from certain sites, but from South Africa, as I said, if you do it, you are inviting those baggages. If you are uh, ready to accept those baggages, it's fine. Uh, if you are doing it from Russia or China, no, nobody will ask you any question. But in rest of the world, I think, uh, I don't know about rest of the world, but from South Africa, you definitely would and be bringing in those baggages. You understand what I'm saying, there's all this copyright business and so on. Copyright doesn't work in China or Russia, so mm, they didn't sign it. So that's why you will find all those sites, uh, Libgen and so on, they are all Russian or Chinese sites. So from there you can download these books. It's a book by, uh, forgetting the name right now, uh, but it's a book which is being written, ah, Dairun. So it's a book which is being written in a very loose and storytelling style. And you will see in the footnotes lots of explanations of why, and even explanations uh, on the usage and the, how the mathematical community reacted to certain usage and the politics behind it and so on, everything is there in that book. It's a, it's a, it's a book written by one of the uh, great uh, mathematicians of our times. Uh, I'll send you, if you can read it, you will see many of these discussions, how these, and these historical discussions, these uh, concepts, how these were built, uh, because he is one person who went through these different phase, phases of this development. So he knows, uh, 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 with his personal experience, he knows the troubles that were there before, 
how they were remedied, how the mathematical community reacted, how there were alternative solutions and so on and so forth. So you'll find a lot more back, a lot more thing to uh, read about. So I'll send you, if you find the time, you can read it. And you will see that there was a time um, when, uh, when people didn't think about the codomain at all. So I'll, uh, if this book, these books which do it, were written, say, 200 years or 300 years before, it would not have been flawed. But then the language at that time was uh, not set theoretically. Okay, but now, having established the fact that the language is set theoretic, you cannot uh, make, uh, you cannot uh, keep yourself afloat on one feet on one log and another feet on another log. Yeah. So that's a dangerous thing. But, uh, for instance, uh, when when first Vestras came up with the notion of a function which is uh, continuous yet not differentiable at a single point, his professor Kronecker uh, told his uh, colleagues that I wonder how, why Gottingen is appointing idiots as professors these days because uh, to Kronecker the function is continuous means it's differentiable. It's absolutely so he doesn't have this, but then Westress is coming at a time when set theoretically the notion of continuity is defined by that for all epsilon and blah blah blah, that's the sentence. And as a consequence, there exists a function which is uh, continuous but not differentiable. But Kronecker's uh, functions are completely different. And that was shown that Kronecker was not wrong and uh, the fact that the moment you accept continuity, they are differentiable. This holds in a completely different universe of sex. It's true. So Kronecker was possibly uh, think, used to think in that kind of a world. So, uh, it's very difficult, as I said, in mathematics, it is very difficult to say that something is flawed unless you can come and exhibit a contradiction. Okay? But then there can be you know, ways and means of uh, removing that contradiction. might be that you can phrase a, another system in which that is a perfectly valid statement. So, uh, this course should at least tell you that there is nothing called absolute certainty. It depends on your belief. Your actions reflect your beliefs. So, everything follows from that belief. Right? And which ones are you going to take your be be belief or your actions? Well, it depends on you. So, yeah. Unless you take something A and not A, both of them, and agree to use Boolean uh, logic as your deduction. Uh, so, when you come up at completely inconsistent. Uh, so, unless you do something trivial like that, uh, saying that something is completely flawed or whatever, is a very difficult statement to make in mathematics. Yeah? It's a game, it's a game. It's almost like pure art. It's not a science. Uh, maybe mm, Ben would like this statement, it is more like a pure form of art, not a science. And we will see many instances of this as we go on. This is not a science, it's a pure art. It's a fine art kind of thing. Okay.
next. If we don't have any, it's already nine, so um, it's quite late, maybe. So then we will call it a day if we don't have anything else. Was that an apprehension or? No, that's my dog barking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um. So the dog also uh, uh, applauded the statement that it should be called a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then keep well, and we meet next week. Thank you. Uh, by Thanks, the way, Johnson, good night. Good night. Good night. By the, one minute. One minute. One minute. Uh, Zander, are you going to join us on this on the Fridays for uh, on this night? Uh, doctor, I just want to contact um, another professor for group theory, and I want to ask him about. Sure the project there and after he replied I'll let you know okay sure then Malad yes, say thank you very much, this doctor. week thank you uh, Malad say this week I will not be available for the whole of uh, for Thursday and Friday so I think uh, we will have to drop our uh, Friday's uh, session oh, oh, okay because now um, with, with, with in light of what we said earlier with regard to some of the work, because uh, uh, the, the the work has had started to become overwhelming because I thought that I had to do everything. So now I can also catch up on or maybe <coughs> shorten my workload with regard to this module and then also yeah uh, look into uh, what we discuss on Friday. So it will be a good opportunity for me to catch up then. Okay, that's fine. So, and uh, if many if of I, you were thinking that so many equations and so many proofs, I hope there was some light today in saying that you should be not proving all of them, but proving sufficiently many of them. Right? Clear? Yes, yeah. Doctor, you do have a lot of questions. Yeah. So, in that light, I don't think it should be overwhelming, also given the fact that uh, these are things which are already known to you. Uh, so, uh, this algebra of sets and relations and functions are quite known to you, So, the, although there are so many facts, but there are some which are enough to be proved. You have to find them, and then the rest can be done from there, so that reduces a lot. And then for the more important ones, as I as we go through the week, I will tell that this is the more important one. Uh, this is the new things that we are going to do in this course and so on. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, bid you all farewell, keep well, and we meet next week. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.